This is Mark Ebar, Vice President of the uh, International Hydrofoil Society, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, particular topic. I'll be uh, running through a retrospective of the Navy's PHM Patrol Hydrofoil Missile Program. This is the outline that I'll be following in, uh, later in the uh, 50th anniversary celebration uh, during the Q&A sessions. Uh, we'll be using this outline to, uh, to focus on specific areas that, that raise questions. PHM Beginnings, it was the first U.S. Navy program to complete all aspects of design and construction, uh, tech eval, and operation evaluation required by U.S. DOD fly before buy policies. It was an extensive pre-delivery test and evaluation program on PHM-1 uh, to resolve technical issues and take corrective actions, and uh, this effort took about two and a half years. The beginnings of PHM uh, started uh, as a NATO, basically a NATO analysis. Back in the early 70s, uh, the Soviets were, were fielding various high-speed craft, including hydrofoils. Uh, the uh, Sarancha is shown in the, uh, on this slide, uh, about 30,000 30, horsepower, 300-ton uh, craft uh, with surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The uh, NATO analysis led to agreement among the United States, West Germany, and Italy in 1972 to uh, develop a common design an acquisition program, and that program was strongly supported by Admiral Zumwalt, who was the CNO at the time, and who was envisioning a high-low mix of uh, ships in the U.S. Navy, uh, higher-end ships, frigates, destroyers, and cruisers, but uh, also a need for small, uh, small ships, high-speed ships to counter so the Soviet threat, primarily in the North Sea and Baltic. NATO agreed upon the operational characteristics shown on this slide, about 250 metric ton displacement, a single large LM2500 gas turbine manufactured by General Electric, and two German diesels for low-speed holborn operations, a crew of about 23 people, oilborne speed at that time was classified, uh, stated as 40 plus knots in calm water and 40 knots in sea state 5, which is a significant wave height of about 10 feet, a uh, Holborn speed of 11, range is 750 miles for Holborn. And the draft uh, requirements were, were fairly constrained. This is important for the PHM to be able to operate in and out of small ports. There were two NATO variants, basic variants. One, which was suited for Germany and Italy with tailored uh, weapon systems and electronics, and then a U.S. variant. A uh, key difference was in the surface-to-surface -surface missile included in the design U.S. Uh, would utilize harpoon missiles uh, manufactured in, in the United States and the German and Italian variants uh, using uh, French Exocet surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The initial plan in the U.S. was to build a, uh, several squadrons totaling about 30 PHMs. This was reduced subsequently and, and uh, resulted finally in uh, a one ship, a uh, one squadron of six ships in 1975. Italy announced in 1974 that they wouldn't enter production, but they continued to participate and uh, have representatives in the program office. Germany remained a full partner further on, uh, awaiting decision in the U.S. on whether uh, the U.S. program would go beyond just a lead ship. The lead ship was PHM-1 USS Pegasus. It was built by Boeing, launched in June of 74, first flight in February 75, and commissioned in July 77. It was operated for quite a few years, uh, up until July of 93, when the entire class of PHMs was decommissioned. I'll talk more about that later. Production ship PHM-1 uh, began a very extensive tech eval and op eval, which I mentioned in the uh, earlier slide. And uh, the upper figure here sh shows a PHM launching a harpoon surface-to-surface -surface missile in Sea State 3. This shows PHM-1 a launch in the uh, Renton 
facility out in Washington State near Seattle. Uh, PHM and the, uh, also the follow ships, which I'll talk about uh, more, were uh, constructed in a facility that was originally intended for the supersonic transport commercial high-speed airliner, which uh, didn't come to fruition. But it was interesting uh, to visit the, the uh, plant during the production ship program where multiple ships were under construction simultaneously. This is the characteristics of PHM-1 as built. I won't dwell on the slide, but about 241 tons uh, gas turbine for foil-borne diesels for hull-borne slow-speed propulsion. The electrical system uh, generated power at 400 cycles, similar to a commercial airliner, and then converted as required for 60 cycle loads. The hull was welded aluminum, struts and foils, 17-4 uh, corrosion-resistant steel, and as you might imagine, with these dissimilar materials, uh, corrosion was uh, uh, potentially an issue and uh, wound up in the eventual installation of an impressed current cathodic protection system to avoid corrosion. Uh, this slide shows some of the features of the hull form for the PHMs. Uh, required a very good uh, sea keeping and characteristics and powering at, at low speed on the hull. And also a hull form that facilitate takeoff and uh, foil one operations uh, in rough water. Foil system configuration is shown in this slide. Both the forward and aft strut foil systems are retractable over the bow and stern. Uh, the aft strut also incorporated the water jets for uh, uh, water jet inlet ducting, and I'll talk about more in the next figure. Here's the propulsion system. Uh, the way it works is there are pods on the afterfoil strut system, a pod on either side. Uh, water, seawater is ingested into those inlets, uh, pushed up through the struts and the ducting shown. The ducting on either side flows into a water jet pump. The pump is driven via uh, LM2500 in a reduction gear and basically accelerates the water flow out through the transom. And at foil borne speeds, uh, the PHM foil borne water jet was uh, putting through anywhere from 90 to 100,000 gallons per minute. Because of the fully submerged foil system uh, and the uh, clearance between the hull and the water, with only the slender struts basically supporting the hull, an automatic control system is required, which consists of computers, uh, height sensors up forward and uh, various software and actuators, F flaps on both the forward and, and aft foils. And uh, this automatic control system allowed for very high turn rate coordinated turns. You see the, in the figure the, the ship banking into a turn. And the PHM was capable of turn rates of on the order of 12 degrees per second at speeds of uh, upwards of 48 knots, fairly significant maneuverability. In the ship. You'll notice the after foil has a W shape with the outer foil surfaces angled down, and this was uh, necessary to keep those portions of the foil immersed in the water during high, high turn rate turns. At the completion of the OPA valve, PHM 1 had traveled over 25,000 miles. In uh, 75, as I mentioned, the program was reduced to six ships. In May of 77, uh, two months before Congress reinstated the program, there was a, uh, a hiccup for a short period of time. The German Navy decided instead of procuring PHMs uh, to build conventional hull fast patrol boats, fast attack craft, and there's a backup slide in the presentation that shows those. They built this 143 class in quantity and accepted the fact that, that those fast patrol craft, which were about 40 knot capable in calm water, would have reduced sea keeping characteristics in rough water uh, with the uh, resultant impact on you know, crew proficiency in, in rough seas. But they were opting for a greater quantity of, of ships, albeit with reduced quality in terms of ride and ship motions. 
There were significant tech technical issues that surfaced during the PHM-1 trials and tests. A number of design areas required modification, hull structure, producibility to reduce uh, different sizes of parts and, and improve speed of construction and, and uh, reduce cost. The strut and foil system, the stainless steel, uh, had fatigue life issues. There were outer tolerance contours on the, uh, especially the after foil, which resulted in some cavitation erosion. So the, uh, the entire foil system hydrodynamic uh, improvement goals were to uh, maintain better quality control in the fabrication of the foils and then thereby reduce cavitation on the upper surface. Foilborne gearbox and water jet pump were upgraded and improved in terms of uh, gear loadings. Uh, water jet pump was refined in terms of its hydrodynamic design to reduce cavitation, induced erosion within the pump. And the frequency converters had to be uh, modified to improve their reliability. All of this change added about six metric tons to the full load displacement and required upgrading of the gas turbine, uh, the pump, and the gearbox, and so forth. Okay, so after the uh, PHM1 trials and, and all the uh, design changes, there was a review of the production ship design, the follow ship design required uh, within the Navy and also to be presented to Congress before there was approval to build five more ships. And uh, I was involved in, in, in that effort to quite a degree. So this chart shows PHM2, PHM3 with their commissioning dates, PHM4 and 5 on this slide, and finally PHM6, Gemini. The Pegasus initially home ported in Little Creek, Virginia until the uh, follow ships arrived. The home port in 1980 was shifted to Key West uh, for PHM1 and also the follow ships and, and uh, basically the PHMs took on what was inherently a Coast Guard mission but a mission that uh, for which the Coast Guard did not have satisfactory high-speed uh, ships to uh, to chase uh, drug running boats that operated in the Caribbean. So the the squadron was a short base but required logistic support from a, a mobile support group which consisted of about 80 8 by 8 by 20 containers uh, carrying spare parts, equipment, and so forth to support the entire six ship squadron which was constituted in the spring of 83. The picture in the center shows one of the PHMs down near Key West with spectators and one of the piers down there watching the ship leave at sunset. And then the, uh, the uh, picture on the right shows all six ships operating foilborne. This slide talks about some of the squadron operations. The PHMs participated in the war down in Grenada, worked with battle groups to develop tactics, conducted port visits, and did trial deployments. Uh, I should mention that in certain uh, missions, parts of the squadron were deployed anywhere from two to four uh, ships, uh, missions that required fewer than the total six ship squadron. And what the fleet would do would be to embark a subset of the mobile logistics support group complex onto other ships of opportunity in the naval force and thereby be able to support part squadron operations. PHMs are very successful in doing counter drug ops, shown on the right hand piece of the slide, interdicted about 220,000 pounds of marijuana, uh, 12,000 in cocaine, 12,000 pounds, received a number of unit awards in the Coast Guard. Why were the PHMs so effective? Of course, they had a lot of speed. Uh, they can conduct uh, fast turnaround times in terms of their home porting and getting out to where they were needed, and could intercept uh, other high-speed crafts, and particularly the, the drug running boats at that time, cigarette boats, which were capable of uh, 60 knots plus in calm order. But where the PHMs were successful, successful was that they could operate for greater distances and also at higher speeds and waves. The main reason for that is that PHM speed was in, essentially uh, not degraded at all. Uh, at up speeds of 48 to 50 knots and, w and wave heights of uh, 10 feet plus.
Okay, getting on to the decommissioning, which I attended July 93, uh, the ships made an incredible contribution to the war on drugs. The uh, key issue was that uh, this being a, inherently a Coast Guard mission, uh, some of the Navy leadership felt it was inappropriate for the Navy to be performing that, that role, uh, which was somewhat short-sighted. Uh, what happened subsequent to the decommissioning was that other Navy surface ships had greater costs were employed in performing the mission. In fact, the operating cost per unit of a PHM was about one-third that of a of FFG-7 class, which was in the fleet at that time. And the, uh, the issue at the top was uh, the 600-ship Navy, which was being pursued by uh, President Reagan earlier on, and, and the Navy was kind of clawing its way to a 600-ship fleet, and the PHMs being commissioned, ships were counted in the official count, and thereby uh, resulted in the, the uh, fewer available frigates and destroyers or other surface ships to be included in that count. So it was a combination of uh, budgetary constraints, uh, the reluctance for the Navy to be conducting the Coast Guard mission and so forth. But as a result of uh, the Navy decommissioning and uh, plans to scrap the ships, uh, they were offered up for sale. And uh, luckily one was actually purchased prior to being scrapped. Uh, I was involved in pro providing uh, tech manuals for this ship and it was purchased by a private citizen, Elliot James. And he was able to bring the boat around from Norfolk up the Mississippi River on Holborn diesels and that initiated the beginnings of a, the USS Ares Hydrofoil Memorial, uh, which is uh, under the umbrella and related to the uh, Naval Sh Historic uh, Ship Association, the uh, International Hydrofoil Society. The Ares is quite complete, and eventually Elliot James intends to bring the, uh, the boat back to flying condition. There'll be a separate presentation during this celebration by Elliot James, including a walk through the ship. Since the initiation of the museum, uh, Elliot has added uh, other boats, uh, now numbering a total of seven, many of which have been restored to operating condition. That concludes the uh, presentation. I have several backup slides. I mentioned the, uh, the Soviet Sarancha class, which was operating and caused the consternation within NATO and resulted in the PHM program. This chart shows some more details about the timeline for the program. Some of the key NATO milestones, more details on how the squadron was supported uh, in and out of Key West. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, both the German Navy and the Italian Navy uh, dropped out and built other, other fast patrol boats. This was uh, the German Type 143 fast attack craft and its characteristics. This slide shows the Italian Sparviero class, uh, which the uh, Italian Navy chose to build in, in, uh, in lieu of the uh, continued participation of the PHM program. It was a scale-up of the uh, PGH-2 Tucum Carry design uh, built by Boeing. And the, uh, the other presentation I have here at the celebration covers U.S. Navy hydrofoil de development, where two can carry is described further. So this is a scale-up, uh, similar configuration to the two can carry, a uh, little bit greater displacement, utilizing uh, gas turbine propulsion and water jet, and a similar foil arrangement to the PHM, although at about one-fourth of the, uh, the foil displacement.